Hi, welcome back to Off the Cuff, Evacor Healthcare's podcast. I'm your host, Emily Coe. And today our guests are Dr. Mary Kay Barton and Dr. Gary Jones. And we're gonna talk about oncology clinical trials. Thank you, Dr. Jones and Dr. Barton for joining today. Uh, I'm very excited to talk to you about oncology clinical trials. But before we do, let's hear a little bit about your um, respective backgrounds. I'm in New York. I trained in New York City at Mount Sinai. I am um, a medical oncologist uh, working in the community a little north of New York City after, after um, training uh, in the community oncology. I uh, did that for many years. And uh, during the course of that, I also had a, did a lot of work in continuing medical education development. Uh, and I've been at Evacorn now for... Uh, the past four and a half years in utilization management and and now a senior medical director for medical oncology. Great. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Um, Dr. Jones, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, Sure. So I'm a board certified pediatric hematologist oncologist. Um, I live here in the Kansas City area. I've been here, uh, did my fellowship uh, here training at uh, Children's Mercy Hospital here in Kansas City and um, stayed on as faculty for about six years as a uh, pediatric hematology oncology hospitalist, um, dealing with the inpatient side of uh, care, um, working with chemotherapy treatments and uh, bone marrow transplant, dabbling a little bit. Great. Thank you so much. So let's uh, jump right in. Uh, I think this is a really great topic. Um, we're coming off the tail end of a lot of media talking about clinical trials specific to COVID. And I know that's those are not oncology clinical trials, but uh, folks um, have heard a lot of the buzzwords that you that are used regarding clinical trials. Dr. Barton, for the folks who are listening, can you um, provide a little bit of um, just a background on exactly what is an oncology clinical trial? I know it sounds like a very basic question, but there might be folks who've never really um, thought about an oncology you know, or cancer clinical trial. Basically, the clinical trial is doing, you know, uh, looking for how therapies are going, new therapies or new approaches are going to work in terms of treating uh, a cancer. It's such a huge subject. It's hard right. to know where to start, to be honest with you. I yeah. mean, but it, you know, there's different phases of clinical trials. So you hear a lot about there's phase one, there's phase two, there's phase three, there's even phase four clinical trials. Uh, that occur. And, you know, phase one trials are when a drug is very new and you're really looking for dosing, uh, safety and dosing. And once that's established, it'll generally move on to um, a phase two study where there's more participants, you know, in the range of maybe, you know, a hundred to a couple few hundred patients uh, and looking further at the safety, always looking at the safety, but you have that dose from the phase one trial and then you move on and look how well that works, that drug works. So you're looking at the safety more in the phase two, as well as how well it works against a particular disease. And then phase three is actually doing comparisons. So you take that information you've gotten, you have promising results from a phase two, it looks like it's working. Uh, So then you compare it to uh, either the standard of care versus the new treatment or sometimes even versus a placebo, it depends on the clinical scenario, what you would use to compare. But the phase three is really comparative to see if the new therapy works better than the old therapy, really. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, And Dr. Jones, so um, you are work in pediatric oncology. Um, How about how, what percentage of your um, patients were on clinical trials? You know, you hear a lot about pediatric oncology trials, um, are they pretty, are they more common in children um, than just a, um, a regular course of care for oncology treatment in pediatric? I, I would say most of our patients, um, the goal is for, as, as far as pediatrics goes, the goal is to try to get everybody enrolled in a clinical trial because of the information that we can gain. I think one important distinction to, to note, especially in, when talking about cancer, treatments and, and cancer clinical trials is, is the fact that we're dealing with things that are so rare to begin with, um, you know, and so, so you need a certain amount of numbers in order to provide enough information to, 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 to tell whether the information is accurate or not. You know, if you have small numbers, then it's hard to, to, to broaden that out to a, 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 you know, a general population, but the more numbers you have, um, the more information you can gather and you can tell 
trends then in, in that case. And so, you know, considering cancer in and of itself is still fairly rare, even though as oncologists, we certainly see it all the time. Um, it, it's still fairly rare, especially in pediatrics, it's, it's pretty rare. And so you try to gather as much information as you can. So you try to enroll as many patients as you can. Um, however, I'd, I'd say probably, it, you know, if I had to take a guess, I haven't looked at latest numbers. I've been out of clinical for, for the past year or so, but um, when I was in practice, it was probably around 50% or so. Um, usually about half would, would enroll or, or at least start to enroll. Um, and then um, half would, would not be interested. But you would offer it to, to pretty much all patients as they come in if they if if I should say if there was a clinical trial available. Sometimes they're just not available for a specific diagnosis. That's very interesting. I didn't realize that you tried to offer a clinical trial to almost all pediatric patients. That's interesting, yeah. um, Dr. Barton. With um, adults, uh, you know, how often um, are folks able to enroll in a clinical trial? I. I, I I'm just trying to get a lay of the land, just the landscape for how many clinical trials are ongoing. And, um, you know, is it common for an adult oncologist to um, enroll a patient or try to get a patient enrolled? Uh, you know, it is. It's different from the, the pediatric landscape is definitely different. I mean, I, like like Dr. Jones was saying, the, you know, 50 to 60 percent of pediatric uh, patients are actually enrolled in clinical trials. In the adult population, it's really under 5% of, of patients are, in, are enrolled in clinical trials, uh, which is obviously a really big difference. Uh, I mean, cancer is not as rare uh, in, in, in adults as it is in children. So, you know, maybe we don't have as much of incentive to, to get people on trials, but you know, ideally, ideally every patient should could be offered if there is one available, which there, you know, there may may not be uh, something available for their particular situation. Uh, but ideally, ideally, would love to be able to try to to enroll every offer enrollment to every patient. Uh, but again, there are a multitude of. Uh, barriers to enrolling on clinical trials, uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of lot of studies trying to break down those barriers. A lot of new approaches to try to break down those barriers. But yeah, the reality is right now less than five percent of adults are enrolled in clinical trials. Um, so yeah, and I and ideally yes, everyone would be offered one. I mean, there's been studies shown that uh, surveys shown that the majority of patients would be interested if offered clinical trials. Actually. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, patients who are uh, maybe more informed when they have come to an oncologist and say, hey, I was at the National Cancer Institute website. I see that there's a clinical trial for my type of cancer. Can you look into this? So that's a welcome request um, when patients come with that information. You know, it, 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 yeah, it all depends. It all depends yeah. on where they are, who they're talking to. Yeah. Uh, but yes, in general, yes, all medical oncologists are well versed in clinical trials. I yeah. know, you know, it's easy to find. It's there's databases, it's the NCI database for cl cancer clinical trials. There's clinicaltrials.gov. That's uh, you know a, a global database of cancer of of trials, actually, not just cancer trials. So, you know, you can do these searches pretty easily. And then everybody knows what's on in their community at their nearby academic centers mm -hmm. or even within their community practices. Right. Clinicaltrials.gov for folks who are listening, um, if you're interested in learning about the different um, clinical, uh, clinical trials, oncology and not oncology, um, that's where you can go. So it's um, just clinicaltrials.gov. I mean, the single most important thing is that, you know, that, Primary care physicians, uh, we encourage them to, you know, tell their patients to ask their oncologist or even talk to the oncologist about trials because the patients often have better, longer relationships with their primary mm -hmm. care doctor and they trust them more, just know them better. So mm -hmm. you know, primary care doctor can ask them to ask their, their oncologist and encourage patients to, 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 to ask their oncologist about clinical trials and just to keep it on everybody's radar. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about um, adverse events, um, and Dr. Jones, you um, might have some um, insight into this um, from working with your patients. So at what point is um, maybe a side effect or um, something unexpected um, documented as an adverse event or severe adverse event um, in, let's say, a pediatric um, oncology trial? 
most trials, as you enroll in the trial, there's usually stipulations on things that you have to report. This is a reportable thing or this is not a reportable thing. Um, however, in most cases, uh, most, most adverse events, most uh, unexpected outcomes or unexpected um, symptoms or some change in, in clinical status, most of those things are going to be reported to um, the study board, the, the group that, that is heading up the study. One of the difficulties that you run into is, is, uh, is kind of trying to distinguish, you know, is this adverse event a direct result of the treatment that you're getting, or is this something that's kind of unrelated? And so that's oftentimes something they have to try to sort through and try to determine. Um, and, and so from that standpoint, they want to try to know as much as they can, because if they're seeing in multiple different patients, the same issue with multiple different patients, well, then you have to start to think that, that maybe it really is something dealing with the treatment. Um, but if it's, if it's just one or two isolated cases, then maybe it's not the treatment itself. So, so, so oftentimes they, they want to try to gather as much information as they can. And then they, they try to sort through and try to determine whether this is directly related or whether it's just an associated mm -hmm. something that, that yeah. may be occurring. I guess there are certain adverse events, um, that could stop a trial in its course. Oh, absolutely. Uh, if something's deemed and yeah. Yeah, if there's, if there's any concern at all about um, uh, something causing a, a severe reaction or a severe outcome um, in, in the trial and, and it's felt to be directly related to the treatment, you know, you know say, say somebody got a, a treatment course and something happened pretty quickly after and it's felt to be a direct result of that, then, then that um, is obviously taken into strong consideration. And, and sometimes they'll pause, they'll pause trials uh, for a time period, they'll just shut it down for a bit to enrollment. They'll they'll tell everybody just stop for a minute and and kind of put you on hold while they try to determine next steps and what to do. Um, uh, sometimes, if it's severe enough and they determine it really was the, the the medication that was causing the problem, then then they may shut down the trial altogether and, and just stop it and and everybody shifts to the to the other arm of the trial. So um, so yeah, there's there's variable different reactions and a lot of that is just dependent on on what it is that that happened and. Mm -hmm. and, and what's going on. So in adults, um, I'm just curious about, you know, if someone has breast cancer, you typically hear, and I know there are different types of breast cancer, of course, but, um, you think there, there's kind of a standard of care for breast cancer treatment, or maybe there isn't. Um, and I'm just wondering at what point should someone explore, um, a clinical trial? So if they're being treated for, you know, since breast cancer is a, a more common, type of cancer. I just wanted to um, look at that. Absolutely. Uh, for breast cancer, there's definitely standard of care. I mean, there's no question there's a standard of care for pretty much any scenario. Um, but we're always looking, you know, that's the standard of care, right? We do trials because to see right. we need to change the standard of care because it's certainly not. The standard of care is not perfect care. Uh, so there are trials for you know initial diagnosis there certainly are some patients and not not all patients would be appropriate it really depends on the scenario and it depends on what trials are being done and exactly what situation they're in, they're in and exactly what kind of breast cancer they have exactly what stage of breast cancer that they have um, but yeah there are trials up front so yes it's a good question for initial treatment a clinical trial is absolutely not just after you've had you have metastatic disease and, and you've had three or four different treatments, that's, that's, not, that's not the only scenario, certainly. So, so if you talk about clinical trials in general, so the gold standard for a, for a clinical trial would be, uh, they say double blind, randomized, placebo controlled. So, so double blind means that, that the, none of the investigators are aware and, and the participants are not aware of what treatment they're getting. Randomized means that nobody, nobody is, is choosing where they go with a computer computer program or, or envelopes or some, some measure is used to randomize patients. Um, placebo controlled means that you're getting a sugar pill versus the actual treatment. Obviously, that's not ethical to do that in, in cancer treatment. You can't just not treat or give a sugar pill to, to a cancer patient, right? And so, so oftentimes when we're getting into clinical trials from, from, a, from a cancer standpoint is when you're getting into those phase three trials where it's a comparison study, there's always, always, always a standard of care and then you're comparing the current treatment or the current question to the standard of care. And so, so you may be randomized as a patient, you may be randomized to the standard of care arm 
or you may be randomized to the treatment arm. Um, and, and that is randomized, because, but, but it's not double blunt. Usually the, all the providers and the patients are going to know which way they're going. And, and obviously you can't do placebo control because that's just unethical. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but there's always a standard of care that everybody's being treated by. And generally speaking, then the patients that aren't on clinical trial are just getting the standard of care. And so that's the, the current best treatment. So, so everybody's generally getting that standard unless you're on a clinical trial and you're getting that, that whatever that question is that they're trying to answer, you're getting that. You know, one problem is we do call, them, we call the arm, the experiment, the arm where we're looking at the new treatment, we call that the treatment arm, which yeah. probably we shouldn't, right? Because the both, <laughs> both are getting treated. Right, right. So it really doesn't sound good, right? Because if to, to patients, think about that, you know, I don't want to be on the, not be on the treatment the arm, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, so yeah, you know, we should, we probably should rethink uh, some we really have to, words are important, right? And we say that yeah. to patients, you know, there's a treatment arm mm -hmm. and a standard of care. So maybe that doesn't resonate well, right? I mean, I want to be on the treatment right. arm, right? Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> that's, that's right. interesting. Right. Yeah. I don't want a sugar pill. We really have to think, you have to think about the words. They're really important. Yeah. I used to serve on an institutional review board. So one of our um, um, biggest task was to review the consent forms that are often created by um, a, a pharmaceutical company um, to make sure it's you know, readable um, by the patients that they understand what the, the clinical trial is all about. And um, they're hard to read. I mean, I don't know if they've improved since I was serving on an IRB back in the you know early 2000s, but uh, have you seen improvement in consent documents um, for either pediatric or adult? Um, because I just wonder if, you know, unless there's a case manager working with patients, if they truly understand that they might just be getting standard of care and not the experimental um, arm of the, the, the trial. I don't know if I could speak to whether I think they've improved. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not really sure, but I know that our communications outreaches have improved. So I don't know if they're written any better, but I think we do a better job of actually explaining now, but we're hyper aware of explaining better to people. That's good. I can speak from our side. I, and, and again, I, um, our institution, I can speak to, um, we went through great pain, pains <laughs> to, to make sure that we would oftentimes, um, uh, you know, as a hospitalist, I would work all shifts, including night shifts, day shifts. I was, uh, you know, we were covered 24 hour shifts. Um, and, and so oftentimes a patient would come in, we would give them the consent form overnight to, to, to keep an eye or to, to read through, get a chance to, to, to really see if they had any questions on things. Then we would sit down with them for probably an hour the next day, just mm -hmm. sit down with them in their, in their room and, and discuss and walk through the, you know, make sure that they didn't have any questions on, the, on the, uh, um, on the consent form specifically, make sure they didn't have any questions on what the trial intended, um, what was being uh, studied for this particular trial, et cetera. Um, make sure that there were no questions from that standpoint. So we, we really went through great pains, at least at our institution, we, we certainly did to try to make sure that pa patients understood what they were signing up for. Um, and, and again, explaining that what I, what I just explained a minute ago about the difference between, you know, the standard of care arm versus the, versus the treatment arm, quote unquote. Um, <laughs> and then, um, because we called it the treatment arm too. <laughs> so, I know, right? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the standard of care arm versus the treatment arm and, and, um, and answering the question and, and you may end up on the, on the standard of care arm and that's not bad because we don't know whether the treatment works or not. And so, um, and, and again, going through all the pluses and minuses and, and trying to explain all of those things, um, you know, because it, it, you know, I can't, I can't speak to the adult side, but I, I certainly from the pediatric side as a, as a parent, you want to make sure that your child is being, you know, being taken care of. And so we, we definitely would take the time with the parents and, and if they were older teens, make sure that they understood as well, because they'd have to, they can't provide consent, but they can provide assent and, uh, and make sure that they understood what they were signing up for as well. Um, and so make sure everybody was on the same page. So. Dr. Jones, uh, could you tell us a little bit about CAR T trials and how the um, one of the a new type of therapy um, CAR T being used in, in pediatrics? Could you explain a little bit what that stands for and um, and how this might be a really great breakthrough in uh, cancer treatment? Sure, sure, sure. So, um, so CAR T C A R dash T is a chimeric antigen receptor T cells is what that refers to the CAR T. 
Um, basically what they're doing is they're taking a patient's T cells. They, they harvest the T cells through a, a blood. Um, they uh, pull off a patient's blood and harvest out the T cells specifically. Um, they then collect those and they genetically manipulate those T cells to put specific receptors, um, little flags or, or, or binders on the cell surface so that they will bind specifically to cancer cells. And so it's, it's a very targeted therapy directly at um, whatever cancer they're trying to treat. Um, at our institution, we were, um, we were participating in a CAR-T trial specifically for, uh, for ALL patients, um, B-cell uh, leukemias um, specifically, showed great promise. Um, we're still pretty early um, because again, at this point, CAR-T, uh, as far as the last time I, I, I was involved, um, they were still only using it for, for the very severe cases, those that had failed standard of therapy and remission therapy and, and, and so had been through multiple treatments and didn't have very promising um, outcomes. Those were the ones that were getting the, the CAR T cells and, and that therapy. Um, but, but I can tell you from experience, uh, the very promising results. You know, we've, we had patients, international patients, patients not just in the United States, but patients came from other countries. Um, we had a patient from Europe. We had a patient from Central America. Um, came up uh, to Kansas City uh, to get these CAR T cell therapies. They were um, oftentimes in the ICU. By the time they arrived, they they're, they're just in very bad shape. Um, you know, just riddled with with leukemia cells. Um, and within within a few weeks of, of you know the, the CAR T cells themselves, it, it takes time to process those. And that's one of the 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 hangups right now is that is that you harvest the cells and then it takes it takes weeks to get those cells prepped and and to get them. Uh, you know, to get the, the, the manipulation done and then to get them um, um, so that where they pro proliferate the cell. <laughs> Replica, yeah? Yeah. So as they replicate the cells, right. So as, as it, it takes time to get all that set up. And, um, but again, within just a few weeks of, of giving them to the patients, um, both those patients that I, I just referred to, both of them went home. They look great. They, as far as I know, they're still doing well. Last time I heard they were doing great. Um, so, so very promising. I, you know, one of the things that right now they're, they're waiting to see is, is kind of long-term. Um, how long does it last? How long does the effect last? Does it, you know, uh, we're, we're certainly not quite to the five years yet. I don't think um, maybe some of the earliest patients, but, uh, but we still got a long ways to go. Um, they're certainly trying CAR T therapy with uh, other solid tumors. Um, we had a, a, a trial going on with neuroblastoma at our facility as well. Um, it wasn't quite as promising. It, the, the initial effect was just as promising, but but it did not last as long the effect. And so those patients would relapse um, pretty soon. And so, so kind of trying to figure out those, um, those final little pieces and, and how do we get the effect to, to have a longer duration um, in some tumors. Um, I, I, I saw, I was looking through clinical trials just, just the other day and you know, they've got them now for melanomas and uh, myelomas and solid, other solid tumors that they're looking at CAR-T. So it's very promising, very exciting yeah. field right now. For the adults, we have approved, I mean, we have approved CAR T therapies for uh, several lymphomas and the newest one for myeloma. And like you said, there's uh, going on in a lot of different solid tumors, and solid tumors present other uh, challenges just because of more complex microenvironments than the, than the hematological malignancies. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting, uh, you know, next generation, if you will, CAR T trials as well, because, you know, it's, it's all CAR T, it's called, but, you know, what's important is what receptor you're putting on you right. have to have the right target right you don't know right. just you have to have these have different targets so which target is the best target um, and there's by specific there's targets so it may be putting two targets on mm -hmm. the cell not just one target uh and different ways of putting the target on um as both using um using nk cells a different kind of immune cell instead of the T cells. So they're doing some using NK cells. They have a variety of uh, characteristics about them that makes it a little easier to do. And um, ultimately using even allogeneics could, could do allogeneic off the shelf CAR T cells perhaps someday, which would be, which is an area of research. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting, interesting Real things. Yeah. And what about immunotherapies? Um, is, um, is CAR T, Part, also an immunotherapy or is that a separate type of therapy? Uh, could you um, talk about those differences and um, what else may be out there that's um, promising? Immuno, immunotherapy, yes, CAR T cell is a type of immuno. You're taking immune cells, you're changing you know, what receptors that they have on the outside, you're giving them back to patients and act, you know, activating the immune system. So yes, it's an immunotherapy, but there are 
are different immunotherapies that are targeting different areas of the immune system. I mean, the one, the, the PDL and P, the checkpoint inhibitors in the PDL one inhibitors, PDL one inhibitors, um, uh, is an active area of research, and we have multiple approved uh, PD one or checkpoint inhibitors, PD one, PDL one inhibitors. Um, there's been vaccine trials have been going on for a long time. Um, so, I mean, it, when people are talking about immunotherapy trials right now, probably the thing that people are talking the most about would be the checkpoint inhibitors, the the, the agents um, that are the PD one, PDL one inhibitors. And I mean, yes, they're just, they're being basically investigated in all areas. They're approved in multiple, multiple tumors. And, you know, the, the challenge is where are they best right now, really? Are they uh, in what combination, in what line of therapy? You know, increasingly they're being used frontline in combination uh, with different therapies. Uh, what people will respond the best? You're looking for what markers, what can we find in people? Who are the, what's the population who are gonna respond the best? So you're looking for predictive biomarkers in people to see who are going to respond the best to those therapies. So yeah, it's a, it's a huge area of, of research and a wide area of research. For a physician, for an oncologist, it just seems like there's so much out there. How do you even get started on identifying which you know, therapy would be the best approach for your patient who, knew, who is newly diagnosed? Is there, um, are there algorithms and um, you know, programs where you put in the patient data and it helps you arrive at um, um, a, a great likely candidate for therapy? Or is it more just based on the oncologist research and, and knowledge of um, what's happening um, in research at the time? I'd say for, for the more common diagnoses, um, you know, there's certainly protocols in place, uh, and, and every day we're certainly learning more. And so those protocols get adjusted as we learn more, we gain more information through these clinical trials and through adjustments and, and what works better and what doesn't. But, um, but in general, when you have the kind of the more, more common, you know, they're all rare, but they're more common diseases, right? Um, there, there tends to be, you know, trends in certain areas. Uh, there's some genetic markers that may flag as, as this patient may have, uh, you know, worse outcomes or, or better outcomes because of a certain genetic marker uh, or, or certain um, um, uh, gene uh, signals that are being set off. Um, so, so all of those things kind of help to, to, to make determinations on how high risk the patient is or low risk the patient is. And, and that can oftentimes guide the treatment as far as whether they're getting more heavier therapy or, or lighter therapy. Um, again, that's, I, that's specifically pediatrics. I, I, I'm, I can't speak to the adult world. It's, they're very different worlds. I'm, I'm sure Dr. Barton <laughs> can attest. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's, there's certainly certain genetic markers and different flags and things that, uh, that may, may guide you one direction or the other in, in certain treatments or therapies and how aggressive you want to be with certain therapies. I mean, it all depends on the scenario that you're in. You know, every individual is an individual and you start with that patient mm -hmm. and you see exactly what they have, exactly what stage they have, and then uh, talk to them if they're interested in clinical trials, see what's available in your area, within your system, within, you know, something that is potential. And, you know, is there a big program where we put in everything and then it pops out? You know, what's That'd be good nice. for that patient. You know, we don't really have that. I, I know they're working on some AI platforms where they'll even listen, uh, you know, some great, I think they're going to even listen to you talking with the patient and they can, and they can use AI and, you know, s take that information and find trials. Is that going to be in the future? Maybe uh, that's not here right now. It's really looking okay. at your individual in your individual patient and, and knowing what's available and, and, and just thinking about it and doing your search on, uh, the NCI site, clinicaltrials.gov, and also to individual cancer patient, uh, cancer uh, institutions in your area. And I know um, NCCN, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, they update their guidelines often. Um, just, I see, I get emails maybe every week on um, protocols that have been updated. And uh, I just want to point out that Evacor, um, you know, when appropriate, keeps, you know, our guidelines are revised in accordance with NCCN um, so that we are, you know, we stay up to date with the evidence um, so that we are giving patients the, um, the best care available um, for their different type of, of situation. Um, do you, um, Dr. Barton, do you care to uh, elaborate on that 
um, since you work within the guidelines uh, on a day daily basis. Um, uh, do you want to talk about the Evacor um, clinical guidelines? Well, the Evercore guidelines are the NCCN guidelines. We don't actually, we don't develop our own uh, guidelines for cancer treatment. We solely use the NCCN guidelines and, and consider the individual patient as well, because yeah. again, not everything falls into the guidelines. But what we do have actually, um, <clears throat> you know, when you put in a request for Evacor for treatment, you have to answer clinical, you have to answer questions about the patient. So you have to put in very, whatever the tumor is, different things, what's important about that tumor that we need to, to give the NCCN uh, appropriate um, treatment, you need certain information. And you need a fair amount of information to know what NCCN uh, treatment is, it would be recommended. And we're actually taking that, um, that data that is input uh, from the from the provider office and, uh, and partnering with the NCI, um, uh, with, with the NCI, and uh, cancer.gov, their database of cancer trials, and we do a search for them and we'll actually provide um, a cancer.gov search results um, for every patient for which is appropriate um, that, uh, that they put in a request in for treatment through Evacor. So that's actually a new, uh, something new that we've introduced probably maybe I think three, two or three months ago. Oh. That's very interesting. Great. Prior to this podcast, I asked folks um, if they had questions that they would like me to ask. And um, I have a question from someone who um, happens to be a nurse. The question is, there's been speculation that with the current use of mRNA vaccines and the ability to turn on or turn off aspects of cells, that this might be a step closer to treatments for cancer. Is there any truth to that? Well, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the mRNA vaccine, there are mRNA, I mean, Moderna has MR vaccine, mm -hmm. mRNA vaccines in clinical trials for, for cancer. Um, so that specific technology is actually in clinical trials. Um, uh, you know, in terms of turning on and turning off things in cells, I mean, yeah. there's CRISPR technology for actually, you know, deleting yeah. portions of uh, of, of genetic material to get cells to not uh, express certain things. So could that be, uh, you know, that's what they're looking at to do some of the CAR-T manipulation perhaps. Um, so yes, I mean, that technology is being used, you know, how far will it lead or exactly where it'll take us? You know, I don't know, so, you know, it'll be different in different situations, but it's technology, yes, yes, it is I, I think that I think though too the the caution you have to have though because yeah. because it is such a new thing and and that's what I would emphasize to to people that are just watching this and and tuning in is that uh, there's so much that's still unknown you know uh, one of the one of the big problems with any treatment and any new treatment is is unintended consequences right and so um, so while we may you may do well in, in in this area what's the downstream effect and 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 what you know are we, do we end up chasing our tails, causing other problems? And so, right. so that's where you have to be cautious on, on any new, any new therapy, any new treatment. But, uh, but certainly I would agree that I, I, I think it's exciting the, the technological advances we've made in even just the last 10, 10 years, five, 10 years. Uh, it's, it's pretty exciting, pretty exciting for, for cancer research. Um, and something, I want to go back quickly um, to CAR-T um, therapies. Um, I wanted to know about the side effects. So um, you, know, you hear about you know, the, how awful cancer treatment side effects can be. Um, I was just wondering if the CAR-T therapy um, has similar side effects or you know, you know, fewer side effects um, during the course of treatment. It, again, it depends on the patient and how well okay. they tolerate and every patient's a little bit different. And you know, uh, uh, you know, as Dr. Barton has said a few times, every individual, you, you really have to tailor your treatments to every individual. Because okay. um, I, I, again, in, in my experience, and again, my experience is pretty limited, I, you know, um, I've, I've certainly seen some CAR-T patients, but from a pediatric standpoint, it's still so very new. Um, but uh, we've certainly had some promising, promising results, but even then, um, it, it can get, you know, there's some scary moments sometimes um, yeah. where um, patients can get very sick. And sometimes as a result of, of the treatment itself. And so you kind of have to get them through, get them through the side effects. Some of them are very well-known side effects. 
Um, and so you have to kind of get them through those sometimes. Um, and, but the severity is, is very, very independent. Um, you know, it's just, it, you can't really say if it's worse or better than something else. I mean, I think yeah. that as time goes on, you get better at managing it. Like initially the cytokine release uh, syndrome that people get, you, yep. you know, no, we don't we know how to manage it now. So, yeah. you know, it's prevented in a lot of patients it's taken care of quickly. It's looked for and taken care of immediately if it's happening. So, so, you know, as you get experience, those things uh, improve. Mm -hmm. So let's shift gears for a minute and um, let's talk about disparities in, um, in um, cancer care, oncology trials. Um, Dr. Barton, uh, would you mind um, or do you care to talk a little bit about how um, disparities impact someone's course of treatment or and whether or not they get on a clinical trial? Yeah, there, I mean, there are a lot of barriers to clinical trials and our job is really to try to break down those barriers where we can. Um, you know, not just talk about it, actually do it. There was an ASCO, which is the American Society of Clinical Oncology. They have, we have our big meeting every year in June. Uh, and this year, the theme was really, you know, every patient, every, you know, every day trying to break down disparities. That was really the, the theme of the, of the whole meeting. You know, the number of, of, of patients, you know, of minorities, minorities represented in clinical trials is really much lower than the their percentage in the general population. Um, and that was shown very clearly by a large trial that they did using de-identified de um, electronic health record uh, data from like 800 centers. And you could see uh, that it was obvious that the, you know, the minority populations were really underrepresented as, as, as to their population, as to their percentage in the population. And so, you know, what, what do you do about that? They did, there was another really interesting study at uh, University of Pennsylvania, where they had a five year community, uh, intensive community outreach, and they increased their, um, their clinical trial enrollment in minority populations, I mean, by, in, by like two to four fold, they increased their their um, their enrollment and it was really education. They they did real education and reached out to the communities at you know where they were at the churches at the community centers. They uh, partnered with the Health Ride, uh, which used Uber and Lyft to you know to transport people back and forth. That's a huge barrier. Transportation, uh, child care. Um, I mean, I think right now I think they're still doing several hundred. They provide several hundred rides a month. For patients to get back and forth for for uh, for trials, uh, for any kind of clinic visits. So I mean, they did real community education, community outreach, and and real tangible things to help people to break those barriers, and were able to increase their enrollment by you know substantial amounts. Uh, so I think those you know those outreach programs, those you know bringing breaking down the barriers that people often will have uh, is a huge push right now. And being done, and not just talked about. Yeah. Yeah. I just add to that too. Sometimes it's something as simple as, uh, again, something we've seen in pediatrics. Sometimes it's as simple as the, the consent form that you have to sign isn't available in the language that they need to have it. So in order to provide informed consent, you have to understand the consent form. So if, if it's not available in, in, in the language, you know, Spanish or, or um, you know, whatever language, if it's if it's only available in English and and English is not their primary language, that's then you're going to have some some problems enrolling people um, with you know so sometimes the fix is that simple but but certainly there's other socioeconomic issues we certainly have issues with you know uh, getting kids to the to the hospital sometimes again rides may not be available transportation may be uh, may be hard to come by in certain areas um, so so yeah all of those things are very very pertinent yeah. across the board. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe some of the flexibility that we've gotten from we learned with the pandemic in terms of telemedicine, you know, that decreases people's, uh, you know, having to yeah. come in as, as often uh, that breaks down a barrier of uh, more flexibility in terms of um, getting your blood drawn at home. You know, the FDA, um, you, you know, mm -hmm. allowed for some flexibility there. So, you, you know, if we can decrease people's having people having to come into the office so much, and we can keep on doing that going forward, you know, that can help break down a barrier. People are often worried about their insurance coverage. Um, I don't know if they know, but most health plans, I mean, they will, they do cover clinical trials and 
you, you know, you will, you can get from your health plan um, specifically what they're going to pay for, what they're not going to pay for on a clinical trial. And, you know, they'll cover the standard of care portion of it. You know, they won't cover the investigational drug portion or maybe some of the visits, you know, I, I, you know, it depends on the situation, but regardless with your insurance, you can work with your insurance company and they will give you clear, clearly what's going to be covered and what's not going to be covered. So you do get that beforehand. I mean, people might be afraid of coverage as well, but it's there with the health plans um, and in a clear, in a clear way. And there's even case management uh, through the health plans that can be like a liaison between yourself and the, the trial or the provider's office. Yeah, those are great points because when you think of participating in a clinical trial, you think of you know multiple visits to to the provider's office, and um, and I worked in rural Mississippi for a very long time, and it was hard to get folks to just the rural health care clinic um, for an annual checkup. So I can imagine how the transportation nowadays with Uber and so forth. Um, can really open that up for, for everyone um, in, in rural communities. Um, and then health literacy being um, a key social determinant of health. Um, and Dr. Jones, you mentioning the consent forms not even being in all the languages um, represented in a population. I mean, those are just easy wins, I would think, that um, could be addressed to help um, um, reduce the disparities for getting folks um, um, enroll in clinical trials. When someone en enrolls in a clinical trial, um, may, there probably is not just one easy answer, but um, would they, um, is the timeline typically like six months to a year? And, or, you know, what, what kind of time frame would you tell the general public that um, maybe a pediatric um, oncology trial would last? And how many um, face-to-face -face visits would be required. Is that even answerable? Uh, not really, because no. it, it varies according to treatment. You know, for, yeah. for example, I could just take a couple of the a couple more common things that we saw was so if you take a, a ALL, which is by far the most common diagnosis in pediatrics, that's that's our bread and butter what we deal with. Uh, that overall treatment can be anywhere from two and a half to three years, mm -hmm. um, depending on if you're for for girls, it's two and a half years, and for boys, it's three years. And then um, you have follow-up uh, treatments or follow-up uh, visits after that and, and monitoring over time versus AML, acute myeloid leukemia, you know, the, the overall treatment is about, you know, about six months-ish, hmm. you know, and then, um, and then it's just monitoring over time. You don't have a maintenance, maintenance period of, of treatment after that. And so, so it really varies significantly depending on the diagnosis itself, um, the kind of treatments you're receiving. Um, and so that's, that's kind of that discussion that I, I'd alluded to before that you sit down with the parents and say, you know, this is the diagnosis. This is what we'd expect. These are, you know, if there is a clinical trial available, we would discuss that with them as well, what we're studying, what we're looking at. Um, but, but across the board, you study the, or you discuss with them the standard of care and kind of what's going to be expected over time and, um, you know, and, and what they can expect as a family. Cause it's a, it's a lot of stress, not just on the patient, but, on, and I imagine that's the same across, uh, you know, in the adult side as well, as well is that cancer is not an individual diagnosis. It, it affects everybody in that circle of, you know, in, in the families and, and all those, uh, all those uh, with them, so. Yeah, I have to fold into caregivers to everything. That's a, that's a really, really good point. Yeah. Um, you know, caregivers are always involved, even in, with the consent. I mean, maybe not, you know, it's different for pediatrics again, but adults, uh, you know, their children are usually, usually yeah. with them. It's the exact opposite, right? Their children are with them, you know, helping them with the, with the consent. But in terms of time, like you said, I, I mean, you could, I could be enrolling somebody in somebody, something I know is a year of therapy because it's an adjuvant breast cancer trial, say they're going to get, they're curable. They're getting chemotherapy for three months before they're getting treatment for six months after surgery. So it's a set time frame. or it could be somebody who's getting, a drug, um, at, you know, after they failed other things and they're going to get it until they have, if they respond, they keep getting it. If they don't respond, they stop. So, you know, that could be um, a couple months, you know, you just don't know. You just don't know. Yeah. But I'm going to ask you, you said it's different. ALL treatment's different for, it's longer for, it's different for girls and boys. Yeah. The, the relapse rate That's, is, uh, relapse rate is higher in, in males. And so we do have a longer maintenance period for them. Do you? That's interesting. Yeah, so they're on maintenance therapy about six months longer. 
Dr. Jones and Dr. Barton, thank you so much for the conversation today. This has been really informative and this was, has been just um, very educational. Thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. And that's a wrap. Thank you for joining Off the Cuff today. See you next month.